Cold War submarine subterfuge at the edge of the earth. It's freezing cold in here, hence the coat, but you wouldn't know it because my breath isn't crystallizing because actually I'm on a 98 degree set in Los Angeles, California, made up to look like the Arctic. Such are the woes of this great John Sturges, forgotten, underappreciated Cold War actioneer, Ice Station Zebra from 1968 based off the Alistair McLean novel, starring the great Rock Hudson, Ernest Borgnine, Jim Brown, and Jim McGowan, a television actor, in a star-turning role. If only it was in a film that was more appreciated. Just like the director himself, I think this movie is overlooked and undeserving of the one star that Roger Ebert gave it back in 1968. Let's talk about Ice Station Zebra, a really cool movie with a lot of great set pieces and a lot to love. Their orders are to beat the Russians. On board, one man is determined to stop them. One of the more famous uh, historical oddities slash fun facts revolving around this film is the fact that it was a favorite of the reclusive Howard Hughes uh, going into his long fingernail days when he was uh, pissing in jars. When he was holed up in a casino in uh, Las Vegas, he would often call down to the television station that he owned and demand that they play the movie over and over again or whenever it caught his fancy. Like, I just want to see Ice Station Zebra. (laughs) Call down. Yeah, play it. And they'd play it and he'd watch it on television. He also had a uh, 35 millimeter print that he would play in his home uh, almost nonstop. Uh, Hughes was a guy who loved to produce movies. He was always very interested in Hollywood. He had actually hired John Sturges to direct a film with Jane Russell for him, uh, Underwater, in 1956. So he'd worked with him before. He liked his style. This was a fact that was often bewildering to historians and people around him. Just what did Howard Hughes see in this picture? The movie was based on a book by spy novelist Alistair MacLean, who was the sort of Tom Clancy of his day, positioned as a sort of Cold War prognosticator, his service in the Royal Navy during World War II, and inflated claims about his clandestine activities, blowing up bridges behind enemy lines, bolstered his status as a military insider. In fact, Ice Station Zebra was likely based on a real-life Cold War mishap involving the American Corona Satellite Program, which was an orbiting spy probe that would snap pictures over Russian airspace using specially made polyester-based Kodak film, due to the fact that normal celluloid film would crack and break at freezing temperatures above the Earth's atmosphere. When it fell out of orbit and landed somewhere near Iceland, American forces raced to the scene. They scoured the area, but the satellite was never recovered. This occurrence bears a striking resemblance to the plot of Ice Station Zebra, which also involves the downing of an American orbital satellite, which carries precious cargo of photos snapped over Russian airspace. Though curiously, the existence of the program was not declassified until 1995. Whether or not McLean had an inside track on the latest from MI6 and the CIA remains to be seen, but what he did have was a knack for producing taut, exciting, men-on-a-mission stories with high-concept military plots that translated well to the big screen. Initially, producer Martin Ransahoff acquired the rights to McLean's Ice Station Zebra book immediately after its publication to capitalize on the success of the other popular McLean adaption, The Guns of Navarone, but he was also committed to making a movie that was highly realistic and true to life. For that, he would need cooperation from the military, and his script by Paddy Chayefsky wasn't cutting it. Chayefsky, who would go on to author the classic satirical critique of the news media with Network, took a similar approach to his screenplay for Zebra, and submitted less of a spy thriller for general audiences, and more of a critique of the Cold War military machine and the futility of war. What Ransahoff wanted most from the DoD was cooperation. He wanted to tour a nuclear submarine, acquire a military advisor for the picture, and shoot on naval property. But when the Pentagon read Paddy Chayefsky's initial script, they rejected it outright. 
They thought it portrayed some American officers and enlisted men as dumb. They objected to the insinuation that servicemen drank too much and looked at pornography, and they restricted action sequences that involved the sub being sabotaged. Their reasoning being that one sabotaged action sequence was plenty for the purposes of action or adventure, but two sub-sabotage sequences? Well, then it just looks like we're a bunch of bums and it's easy to sabotage an American sub. Rantzahoff relented. He fired Chayefsky and took the film in a safer direction. The crew was allowed to shoot on a submarine dock in San Diego, and they were supplied with plenty of information to make the film as realistic as possible. John Sturges, veteran action director, was brought in to shepherd the Mammoth production. Sturges was at the time one of the highest paid directors in Hollywood. He was a calm, low-key, low-maintenance guy who never lost his cool on set and was known to be good with wrangling movie stars' egos. He being one of the few directors who could coax a committed performance from an increasingly drink-sodden Spencer Tracy in his later days, which he did in Bad Day at Black Rock and The Old Man in the Sea. The Old Man in the Sea was actually a film he was brought in to save after the previous director quit, finding the challenge of shooting out in the elements too difficult. Sturges liked to shoot on location with an ensemble cast, which he did in his most famous films, The Great Escape and The Magnificent Seven. He was an obvious fit, and being a veteran himself, he had an understanding and reverence for the military. In fact, so did many in the cast and crew. Ernest Borgnine and Rock Hudson had both served in the Navy. Gerald O'Laughlin served in the Marine Corps, and many of the special camera effects were achieved by former Navy divers, using specially designed camera mounts made specifically for the film. In fact, some of the camera shots were so daring that Sturges could have easily been killed on the production. While filming the impressive aerial shots of the submarine from the helicopter off the coast of Oahu, 40 mile per hour winds knocked the rotor off of the rescue helicopter meant to accompany them, and the pilot was killed. John Sturges strikes me as a director, while notably pretty apolitical, um, is still someone who's swept up in the majesty of the United States government and its largesse as it pertains to the scientific community, industry, and the space program, as evidenced by two other films he made, The Satan Bug and uh, Marooned in 1969. Both films bookend Ice Station Zebra. We get loving photography of gigantic U.S. military satellites. It's almost beat for beat the same opening sequence as Marooned cool shots of how awesome these control panels are, all the very, very smart people working together to beat the Russians in the Cold War. It's really pretty a, a pretty cool time capsule into 1960s. And he obviously Sturges is fascinated by military technology and procedure. After all, this guy was a noted, along with William, William Wilder in the 1940s, a World War II cameraman who shot a lot of documentaries, First, he started off making instructional films for the military and the soldiers. Then he went and got actual combat footage, some of which is really, really stunning. In these films, oftentimes they're incredibly procedural. We get long, drawn-out sequences where Rock Hudson is directing his crew. Oh, you know, 40 knots this way, blah, blah, blah. A lot of impenetrable dialogue that the audience has no idea what's going on, but it's delivered in such earnest, and it seems so realistic, we're really swept up in it. What's our target doing, Radar? Mark. Bearing 195, range 3000. Looks like we have the beginning of a temperature gradient, Captain, at 50 feet. Take it at 300 feet, Ed. Hold your speed as is. No point in giving him a demonstration. 300 feet, I. Make it 300 feet, Captain. Give me 20 degrees down. 300 feet, 20 degrees down, I. Ice Station Zebra's score is actually tremendous. I loved it, especially when the intermission comes and we get to hear that swelling, amazing score every time the submarine goes underwater. The film begins as we are introduced to Rock Hudson, as he's given a secret mission to retrieve a downed U.S. satellite which contains spy photographs taken over Soviet territory. The satellite lands near a research base and is being held by the scientists who are awaiting military extraction, unless our friends on the other side of the Iron Curtain can get there first. Rock is steadfast and highly watchable in the role, a role which was turned down by Gregory Peck for lacking characterization. But Rock needed a starring role in a big action picture, as he feared he was being typecast in women's weepies and romantic comedies. 
Patrick McGowan's character of the British spy David Jones appears quite literally out of the mist and struts aboard the ship flaunting his top-secret credentials, considering Hudson's Captain Faraday to be little more than a bus driver, someone who should facilitate his mission and not ask questions. McGowan sports a typical British sheen and posh attitude, but atypically he drinks too much and he sleeps with a gun under his pillow. Mr. Jones. Both traits connote lingering trauma from a dark past, which, of course, in turn, makes you a badass. Patrick McGowan, I think, I, I was really blown away by his performance. And I was like, God, what else is this guy in? And besides his television show in the 60s, not much, which is a real shame because he is a guy here who delivers a very, very modern performance. There's especially a certain sequence after the submarine is sabotaged where he just goes off on rock cuts and he starts out slow with his nice British mannered delivery and then he explodes over the top. I haven't labored the point so far because up to now you've been doing all that's been required of you. But the primary objective of this mission is to get me to Ice Station Zebra. Those orders come to you from your chief of naval operations and direct to him from your president. So before we go any further, I suggest that you get me there, put another torpedo up the spout, blow a hole in the ice, and get me there! Throughout the first act, the movie spends time collecting new main characters. Jim Brown's Marine Sergeant and Borgnine's Soviet defector turned American spy both arrive around the 30 minute mark. Their memorable entrance, Roping under the sub from a marine helicopter creates more confusion aboard and more insecurity, though both characters sort of fall flat in their conception. Brown, the famous football player, simply isn't given enough to do, and Borgnine tries to play Vaslov with an air of affability and charm, but it instead comes off as cloying and creepy. Mostly, though, the big four function in the plot as suspects, especially after the standout scene of submarine sabotage. Anyway, it's the first time I know what I want, right? Then I know where... <laughs> This is an incredibly well-staged and exciting sequence, and obviously, how can you have a submarine movie without the spectacle of the thing taking on water at least once? Next, the boat arrives in the Arctic and must break through the thick ice in order to march the troops onto the surface, a sequence which features incredibly lifelike exterior shots of a model submarine submerged on a Hollywood set. You could have fooled me, it looks great. After all that confusion, mayhem, and action, the crew finally arrive at the Arctic, their quest halfway complete. What secrets will they discover on the surface? What dangers will they encounter? And don't forget, Jim Brown brought a whole battalion of awesome troops. So there must be some serious shit about to go down. So cue the intermission as the audience waits with bated breath. As you reminded me, Mr. Jones, my orders are get you to Zebra. Move about ten minutes. Most people find fault in Ice Station Zebra's third act. It's not terrible, or even as laughable as Roger Ebert suggested. Mostly though, it just doesn't come through on the promise of the film's setup. Though there are high points in the third act. When it's revealed that Ernest Borgdine is actually the saboteur working for the Russians, his turn is rather delightfully sinister. They say a bull in the ring dies a much better death than a steer in a slaughterhouse. A bull has a chance. Do you want to be killed for a bull, Captain? Or a steer? Now pick up the crowbar. It seems that during these scenes, he's actually having fun. I like when McGowan finds the roll of film and the detonation device in the gas tank of the snowmobile. This is a really great little scene of suspense and a really cool hydraulic set. But alas, these bits aren't enough to make up for a muddled climactic sequence. Or these obviously styrofoam rocks. Or this clumsy fight sequence with optically inserted smoke and resized cropped film to retain continuity. Or these abysmal shots of Soviet jet fighters, which Sturges actually lamented later in his career during an interview. And Jim Brown's death during a standoff with Ernest Borgnine, being the result of Patrick McGowan mistakenly believing him to be the real villain, is a nice bit of dramatic irony that raises the stakes and shocks the audience. <laughs> Though at the same time, the film went out of its way to establish Brown as a stern, gung-ho type whose philosophy on leadership is at odds with Hudson's more paternal care for his men. You will notify the men that there will be a showdown inspection at 0700. Yes, sir. And Lieutenant, 
It will be a bitch. Yes, sir. That's all. Yes, sir. You think I was too abrupt with him, huh? I made a point of it. You see, Captain, I've saved a lot of lives by teaching men to jump when I speak. All right. The young lieutenant's a familiar type, popular with the men. As for me, I measure an officer's weakness by every man that likes him personally. The script could have just as easily dispatched with other more sympathetic but inconsequential supporting characters played by Tony Bill or Gerald O'Laughlin, and therefore mine some drama out of the climactic conflict with Brown, say, opposed to what he perceives as Soviet appeasement by Hudson. Maybe it could have been a three-way standoff, with Brown taking control of his men and demanding Hudson give him the role of film from the satellite. The final climax is a little bit muddled. You're not actually sure what's going on. There are too many MacGuffins, pseudo-MacGuffins, double crosses, and the mounting of the actual climax it doesn't really go off because the suspense really isn't there. There's too much brokering and threats that never come through. So we're just kind of sitting in this like odd detente. Now it's ultimately satisfying in the way that it ends where it shows that there could be sort of a peacetime friendship, mutual understanding between us and the USSR, which is a theme that Sturge is also employed in Marooned where uh, the stranded crew of the American space shuttle are given a hand by the communist Russian satellite. Commander Faraday, the capsule has been destroyed. Our mission is therefore accomplished, at least in part. Your mission is also accomplished to the same degree. It is unfortunate that the officer was shot apparently by accident. Yes. But the conflict between us would be pointless. I've given the command to my fighter planes to return to base. My men and myself will be picked up within the hour. And we'll be on our way. We're a long way from home. We both are. Come on. That's for Daniel. Until you meet again. Yes. Until we meet again. Ice Station Zebra is a movie that I saw and automatically knew that I had to own on Blu-ray because number one, it's sumptuous, it's beautiful, the score is terrific, the performances are good, and it really is kind of a little bit of a cozy movie. I really enjoyed it. I love adventure films like that with a lot of uh, double crossing and a lot of, you know, who done it. And uh, I think it's a really nice little movie. I would recommend it. You all check it out. It's a lot of fun. I've watched it four times this year. So Ice Station Zebra, I give it a hearty thumbs up. <laughs>